Almost five years ago, gamers around the world were stunned by the unveiling of the Final Fantasy VII Remake. And ever since that moment, there has been a huge spotlight on Square Enix from the media, but also from the fans. Even before it existed, in an official sense, anticipation around the potential for a Final Fantasy VII Remake was significant, and in the past few years, as we've learnt more and the final product has felt more tangible, that sense of anticipation has only continued to grow. It's why the Japanese commercial that aired towards the end of last year was so poignant, as it told the story of why the original game means so much to so many people, and I'd include myself in that grouping, as Final Fantasy VII was the game that sucked me in like no game ever had before. And therein lies part of the challenge with this remake. From the outset, Square Enix made it clear that they wanted to make a game that was appealing to both fans of the original and a whole new generation of gamers who may not have even been born when Final Fantasy VII released over 22 years ago. That's no simple task, but now the remake is in our hands, it's time to take a look to see if it delivers. In today's video, we will look at some of the new things that have been brought to the table while also comparing to the original where it makes sense to do so, and in the spirit of keeping this spoiler free, we will not be delving into any mid to late game content outside of what Square Enix themselves has shown off in the public domain, so don't worry about being spoilt if you have never had the opportunity to play the original. I also need to note that for the purposes of this review, Square Enix provided a free copy of the game, but this did not affect our judgement or influence anything we're about to say. Final Fantasy VII Remake is an action RPG that pulls from a variety of sources to make what feels like a wholly original gameplay experience. Many franchise hallmarks are there, such as the ATB system, party management, and powerful magics and abilities, but how they have been implemented is unique, and makes for a game that doesn't play like anything else previously seen within a mainline Final Fantasy game. The controls are tight, the combat feels quick and responsive, and it makes the game's various encounters often very engaging and pretty enjoyable. Key to this is balance. And in this regard, everything revolves around the brand new ATB system. Staying true to the source material, players cannot perform significant actions, like casting magic or using abilities, unless their ATB bar is charged. The difference now is how the charge is gained. In the olden days, this was much more clear cut. You just had to wait until it was your turn. But due to the evolution into real time combat, the game rewards action as opposed to inaction. While the ATB bar does fill naturally over time, it's not a viable option to just run around and wait due to how slowly it fills. Instead, the most effective way to fill the bar is to land regular attacks. This provides a lot of control, and with the ability to switch between characters, the combat features quite a few layers of depth, not least because each character is quite distinctive in terms of how they play. Within the original game, there were biases amongst the characters, and this played out via their stats. Cloud was a good all-rounder, Barrett and Tifa had similar attributes outside of their dexterity, and Aerith was the de facto mage. These strengths and weaknesses have been taken at face value and amplified, resulting in a direct correlation with how each character handles while in combat. Given his role as the all-rounder and his leading role within the game, Cloud is by far the easiest to get to grips with. Whether it's his general mobility, the utility of his abilities, or the fluidity of switching between Punisher and Overdrive modes, it just feels… right. He also has the highest base strength, and all his other attributes are either the best or second best, so he is the natural choice for dealing damage on a consistent basis. The other characters though are a bit more nuanced. As within the original, Barrett's standout attribute is vitality, Tifa's is speed, and Aerith's are magic and spirit. It means Barrett is able to sponge physical damage, Tifa is incredibly fast and her moveset relies on preparation and timing to maximise damage output, and Aerith offers an alternative thanks to ranged magic based attacks while also casting stronger spells. But to balance these strengths, heavy emphasis has also been placed on manifesting their weaknesses, and it means Barrett and Aerith have poor mobility in combat and slower ATB charges. It's something that should be commended, as it translates the original intention into a current reality, but there is a downside. 
Given the Final Fantasy VII Remake's penchant for fast-paced action, Aerith, for example, feels kind of out of place, as the actions you need to take in order to charge your ATB bar are pretty boring by comparison. Even though it's balanced in that she's technically just as powerful as any other character on face value, she just doesn't feel powerful in the same way that Cloud, Tifa and Barrett do, and in truth, throughout my entire playthrough I often just switch to her through necessity as opposed to a proactive choice around enjoyment. Once ATB charges have been acquired, each character can cast various spells and perform unique abilities, and what's great about this system is that nothing ever feels overpowered as the game progresses. Magic can be upgraded to Ra and Guard tiers in line with Materia growth, but some of the first abilities and spells you acquire will still be useful by the end of the game, and this also applies to the weapons. Just like in the original, there is a clear tiering in terms of base stats, but thanks to the weapon upgrade system, within the remake weapons can be enhanced based on your preferences. It means that if you want to, you can rock up to the final boss still sporting your buster sword without hindering your performance that much, and I appreciated this. For the more discerning though, the weapon upgrade system has tons of potential options depending on how you want each character to perform within your party setup, and this is because more potential is accessible within each weapon as your character's weapon level increases, but there's only a limited amount of SP which needs to be spent on upgrades. To provide further depth, there's a wide range of materia that offer utility outside of just casting spells. Materia can also be combined for extra utility, and as an ode to the original, equipping certain types can affect specific attributes. And when the right abilities and spells are used, they feed well into the pressure stagger system that has been borrowed from Final Fantasy XIII and enhanced. If you are able to exploit a chink in your enemy's armour, they will become pressured and when they are in this state they can be pushed into a stagger. It's during these times that damage can be ramped up for a short period of time and battles often focus around these moments. Should things not be going too well though, classic summons like Shiva, Ifrit and Chocomog can be called upon to turn the tide in your favour. They appear for a specific period of time as an extension of your party with ATB charges being spent to use their abilities. They then perform a significant attack when they leave the fight, and its implementation is perhaps the best we've seen within the franchise so far. When these elements are combined, it makes for a rich, comprehensive gameplay system, and when it works, it really works. This is best demonstrated by the numerous boss fights. Unlike standard enemies, which often don't pose too much of a challenge, boss fights have specific strategies that need to be implemented in order to succeed. It's within these set pieces that everything around the gameplay comes together. You need to understand your character's strengths, exploit enemy weaknesses, and adapt to changing movesets and environments. To be clear, not all the boss fights are winners in terms of their design, but each one poses a unique challenge, and after defeating bosses like the Airbuster and Abzu, it felt like I'd really accomplished something. It was also fascinating to see how these enemies have been recreated, and as I played through the experience I was constantly looking out for and being impressed with how well the developers have done this, even going to quite lengthy extremes to make sure fitting tributes remained intact. One of my favourites in this regard was the Hammer Blaster, due to how they implemented such an outlandish enemy in a very plausible way, but there were so many others, such as the Aero Combatants and the Moth Slasher. Within the original game, the Midgar segment was action packed and set the stage for what would follow, but it wasn't all that lengthy in the grand scheme of things and was very linear. Final Fantasy VII Remake uses the established structure from the original as a guide as opposed to following it like gospel and breaks the experience down into chapters, some of which help to fill in gaps from the original narrative while others display alternative interpretations of events that transpired. From a technical perspective, the chapters fluctuate between ones that are more linear due to having a stronger focus on the core narrative, and ones that allow for a bit more exploration. It offers a nice balance, catering to those who want to travel off the beaten path, while not restricting those who want to push forward and progress at a faster pace. Within each of the more explorative chapters, there are numerous side quests and discovery missions that can be undertaken that associate to that specific area and it's by completing these side quests that you can learn more about the expanded lore, as the main premise for undertaking them is to gain a rapport with the various supporting characters to enhance your prospects as a mercenary. There are a decent number of these to complete, and while they perhaps aren't the most compelling in terms of their individual premises, at no point were any boring or monotonous as there was enough variety. 
It's during these open-ended chapters that you can also take part in numerous distractions, from mini-games like Wackerbox through to pre-built battles in Don Corneo's Colosseum and Shimra's Combat Simulator. Each distraction is inherently different from the last, and they serve as a nice ode to the original. The only gameplay sequence that doesn't quite match up in terms of quality in this regard is the bike segments. The controls are alright, but they are very one-dimensional and the segments last far too long. Given the limited source material of the original, there were question marks as to how the development team could inflate it up to being a 30-40 to 40 hour experience, but they accomplished that feat. The experience definitely felt long enough. My total playtime was just over 30 hours, and at no point did any of the chapters overstay their welcome. Longer, narrative-driven ones were engaging, and the exploratory ones could be progressed at a pace I was comfortable with. Even chapters focused around story elements that did not feature within the original experience felt inclusive, and in general, everything was made much more fluid and manageable thanks to the ability to save whenever you choose, as opposed to having to rely on save points. Upon completion, the developers have also put in place reasons to keep playing, as you gain access to something akin to a New Game Plus mode. You can replay chapters at your leisure while still having access to everything you've acquired during your first playthrough, and while replaying a chapter, you are given EXP and AP boosts. You can also choose hard difficulty, and by playing chapters on this new difficulty setting, you can take part in new challenges and acquire new things. The only annoyance is that some of these new challenges are stuck behind barriers as opposed to being readily available. For example, you can't just go to Don Corneo's Colosseum to check out the new battles. Instead, you have to remember the right chapter and progress through that chapter to the point where it was accessible during a normal playthrough. You must then finish the chapter to make sure progress is retained. It's annoying, but it's a minor issue in the grand scheme of things and doesn't detract from the core structure and pacing. As we've watched the Final Fantasy VII Remake develop over the past few years, it's been pleasing to see how much the visual quality and general presentation has improved. To get to this point, the development team has had to make harsh decisions, but the end product stands as a testament to everything they've accomplished, and the brand new opening sequence sets the tone for everything that follows. Even though I have seen this particular sequence many times prior to release, when I hit new game and was in control, as opposed to watching a video on YouTube, it just felt special. I even got goosebumps, and it just goes to highlight how good the cinematic delivery is within the game. This is, of course, aided by the characters themselves. Cloud looks perfect, and while I dread to think about how many revisions Nomura forced his team to make to get to that point, I don't really care as the end product is just so good. Barrett, Tifa, Aerith and Red 13 have also received the same treatment, but it's not just the main cast that shine in this regard. Significant attention to detail has also been placed on the supporting cast, and it was great to see the members of Avalanche and characters like Heidegger and Scarlet brought to life. I also want to highlight that they even went to the trouble of giving Don Corneo's belly jiggle physics, which just goes to show the level of their dedication. Midgar has also received a lot of love and at times the set pieces are jaw-dropping. It's clear that more focus has been placed on some areas than others though, as the linear areas are more engaging from a visual perspective while the free roam areas are a bit more bland. The major exception in this regard is of course War Market, which is brimming with personality, especially at night. Whether it's the different people you meet, the vibrant and diverse colours, or the constant changes in ambient music, there's just so much going on and it feels like a character in its own right. Music, something that has been so fundamental to the Final Fantasy experience, also plays its part. Amasashi Hamwazu, Mitsuzo Suzuki and all the additional composers and arrangers, of which there were 19 in total, deserve a huge amount of credit. This was one of the areas I was most concerned about, but instead of just updating existing tracks, the team chose to take a different approach. Many of the classic character and Midgar based themes can be heard within brand new pieces of music, which often utilise thematic elements in completely new ways, and via the jukebox, more faithful arrangements of the original source material are also still present. And then there's the story. As noted in the beginning of this video, I won't talk too much about what happens for obvious reasons, but to give an overall summary, upon reflection, I actually really enjoyed it. Cloud Strife stands front and centre of this, and I think it's probably the best representation of him as a character we have ever seen. In the past, the developers have spoken about their struggles with Cloud, 
as the public perception of him as a character has evolved into something different from what they intended, and this influenced their decisions within the compilation. But for the remake, it feels like they reverted back to their original vision. As an ex-soldier, Cloud is confident and sure of himself, but towards the start of the game, it isn't always convincing, in a good way. Other party members often act with contempt over what he says, but with how the story plays out, his struggles are all the more apparent. What was nice about the remake is that even within the Midgar segment, they were able to show growth. Cloud's personality doesn't alter that much, but you can see how other characters are warming to him thanks to his actions as opposed to his words, with the latter becoming a bit of an ongoing joke. And that leads onto something else I very much appreciated. Due to extra time being spent on story, more focus is given to the building of relationships between the characters. There were moments where Cloud, despite being the protagonist, would step back to allow Tifa and Barrett time to reflect on what they were doing, and you start to see the rapport develop between Cloud and Aerith. It makes the formation of the group and its evolving dynamic seem much more plausible. And in general, every character feels more fleshed out. But the biggest change for me was with Barrett. I don't know whether it's because I'm now a father, but some of the scenes where he took centre stage were much more impactful, and I appreciated that they chose to show sides of his personality outside of just being super loud and super aggressive. Humour also returned in a way that I could appreciate. There were so many moments throughout where I did, and this is not an exaggeration, laugh out loud, just because of how absurd and silly things were. I mentioned Don Corneo's jiggle physics, but this relates to so many other characters. Wedge has numerous comedic moments, Johnny is given much more spotlight, and Wall Market is, well, what you'd expect. And what's nice is that they used this comedy within the narrative to help break down some of the barriers with Cloud's personality. They even implemented some ridiculous running animations, and some of the enemies, such as the bandit, were made into a running gag. The developers were also smart with how they brought in and connected with the compilation of Final Fantasy VII. Throughout, there were plenty of nods to wider characters, while others were promoted into bigger roles, and some of the more subtle elements from the original were brought to the fore, such as Rude's affection towards Tifa. They also introduced quite a few new characters as well, such as Marl, Roche and Kyrie, but none of them really add to the overall experience, and I can't see many of them leaving a lasting impression, unless they feature in future parts. Even though Remake is a long experience, I still felt though that they could have done more and pushed things even further. There were times where I wished they'd stuck closer to the source material, but that was more down to personal greed than anything else. I just wanted answers to theories I've developed. And in this regard, it was surprising, given the expansion, that scenes from the original were either cut or glossed over, meaning those answers weren't forthcoming. As an existing fan, I went in with expectations, and as Nojima pointed out prior to release, matching those expectations was near impossible due to how the story was delivered within the original. But I think the important thing to remember is that compared to the original, it's just different now, and the further you get into the experience, the more this becomes apparent. And in this regard, the ending will catch people by surprise. There have been plenty of jokes rolling around about how can you spoil a game that's over 20 years old? And well, I'll just say this, you can and hopefully I'll be delving into that within a future video. In conclusion, Final Fantasy VII Remake has more than enough substance for it to stand apart from the original, but I'd query the decision to call it a remake as it's more of a reimagination. The developers have done such a fantastic job modernising the classic gameplay, and it's impressive how they've factored in so many different nuances that fans will just lap up. They've also done a great job in adapting and expanding the story, but it feels so much different as an overall experience when compared to the original Final Fantasy VII. That's not a bad thing though. The gameplay is immersive, featuring a ton of depth. The characters and story have been fleshed out in positive ways, and after watching the ending, it took me some time to comprehend and come to terms with what I'd just experienced. This game is going to surprise a lot of people in a good way. I will say that given how much reverence I have for the original, I had expectations coming in, and this reimagination may not have been the experience that I thought I wanted, but after taking everything in, the brief disappointment I felt was supplanted by excitement, and right now, I can't wait to see what the future of the Final Fantasy VII Remake project 
has in store for us. There's such a thing as too much excitement. Yeah. And there's still more to come. Guess so. Hope everybody's warmed up. Hey guys, I hope you all enjoyed this video review and are staying safe right now. As always, if you like our work, then please consider subscribing and checking out our Patreon link in the description down below. We should be working on a follow-up video real soon where we'll run through all the spoilers and talking points from this game, so please be excited for that too. Alright guys, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more final fantasy goodness.